right. Welcome, everyone. This is Heather Riggs with the New England Museum Association. I'm here um, in Somerville, Massachusetts. I just want to say hi. Um, some of you guys are actually new people to a NEMA webinar. Uh, we've been holding our webinars in town halls since March when we all came home like everybody else did. Um, I do want to welcome everybody to let you guys all know that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the NEMA website. Um, if you ever miss a NEMA session, um, you can always go to the NEMA website under our calendar of events and there's a link to our YouTube um, page and all of the recordings that are available are there. If you ever have any suggestions for future programming, definitely let a staff, NEMA staff member know. We're always up for anything at the moment. Um, so I would like to start the presentation now. So we're doing a demo and presentation of the Syrian Relief Escape Room Challenge. This is the perfect thing for a Wednesday afternoon. Um, I want to welcome the group from the Hood Museum of Art. I will let um, Jamie Rosenfield actually introduce um, her group. Um, so Jamie, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. So good afternoon. Um, and welcome to the Assyrian Relief Escape Room Challenge and Demo, um, Challenge Demo and Presentation. So as Heather mentioned, I'm Jamie Rosenfeld and I'm the Museum Educator at the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth College. And joining me today are my colleagues, Vivian Ladd, Teaching Specialist and Isadora Italia, Campus Engagement Coordinator. Um, and I'm going to share my screen with our presentation. Um, thumbs up if you can see it. Great, great, okay. Spotlight myself, great. So today we are going to share with you an escape room challenge game that we developed last year for the, for the Hood Museum of Art. And this project is one that we are thrilled to share as it offered an exciting opportunity for us to engage with a well-known work of art in our collection in new and creative ways. So we hope this presentation will inspire you to try your hand at an escape room game at your own institution. This presentation is interactive. So we invite you to turn your camera on if you are comfortable. And we'd love it if you could add your institution to your name so we can see where folks are from. Um, so you can give me either a virtual thumbs up or a a real physical thumbs up if you've ever participated in an escape room before. And I'll just kind of look through. Okay, I see some thumbs up and I see some shaking of heads. Um, so escape rooms are, are themed spaces in which teams attempt to solve a series of challenges in order to escape. Our game is an adaptation of an escape room challenge. So here's what, you know, escape room challenges often look like. Um, escape rooms are by definition immersive and tactile. They involve teamwork and problem solving, conversation and give and take. There's always a level of frustration and confusion and that's usually part of the fun. We have attempted to translate that experience into a virtual workshop format for you today. We hope that we have been successful and we ask for your patience if we have fallen short. We hope at the very least to provide you with a sense of the game as a whole, insight into our process and lessons learned, and the impact of this kind of programming on our different audiences. In order to fully participate, you will need a smartphone um, or tablet with a camera app. So if you do not have one, we will give you a couple of seconds to run and grab it. Um, and I'll just kind of scroll through the participants to see if anyone has left. Looks like you all got the memo. <laughs> that you needed one. Okay, so it looks like most people are still here. Um, so in today's presentation, we'll start by introducing the goals and thinking behind our escape room challenge. We'll then invite you to play the game with us. We'll attempt to solve the first challenge together, and then we'll break you into breakout rooms, and you'll have the chance to solve the second challenge in a small group. So like I said, this is an interactive presentation. Um, after that, we'll come back together in the full group, and we'll walk you through the rest of the challenges. 
At the end, we will share lessons learned, next steps, and answer any questions and hear your thoughts. If at any time during our presentation, you have comments or questions to share, please enter them into the chat and we'll hope to get to all of them at the end of the presentation. So we'll keep track of them as we go. We have muted all of you and we ask that you please do not unmute yourself until we send you off into your breakout rooms. And so before we begin, I just have a couple of reminders. Um, for those of you new to Zoom, I doubt any of you are though, um, we suggest making the following modifications to your screen in order to have the best viewing experience. So if you are on a computer, you should see a green bar at the top of your screen that says, I, Jamie Rosenfeld, am sharing my screen. To the right of that is a tab that reads View Options. Click on View Options and select Side-by-Side -side Mode from the drop-down menu. This will allow you to view both the images and the speaker without overlap. You can also zoom in on images by adjusting the zoom ratio under view options, um, but you need to make sure that your fit to window is your default. Um, this will be important later when we play the game so you can really see all of the visuals. Um, and if you are on an iPad, I believe you can just use your finger to scroll in on the, um, on the PowerPoint. Okay. So oh, for those of you unfamiliar with us, the Hood Museum of Art is Dartmouth College's art museum. Located in Hanover, New Hampshire, it is situated on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki people. We serve the campus community and regional audiences. The museum's collection includes over 65,000 objects from across the globe, spanning thousands of years of human history. We recently completed a renovation and expansion project that in addition to new galleries, which you see here, and teaching spaces, it also added a large public atrium space. Prior to reopening in 2019, we spent time as a staff considering the opportunities provided by the expanded space. So Vivian and I work in the education department which serves primarily K through 12 audiences and the general public. Isadora's position of campus engagement coordinator lives within the external relations team and focuses specifically on engaging Dartmouth students outside of the classroom setting. Though we work in different departments and serve different audiences, we were all interested in offering new, a new program that was social in nature and lighthearted but still remain true to our mission as a teaching museum. We thought it would be exciting to work together to create an escape room inspired by works of art in the museum's collection. As luck would have it, Carrie Sclafani of the Greater Hudson Heritage Network presented her concept for an escape room at the NEMA conference, not this past NEMA conference, but the conference before, and her approach became the basis for our escape room game. Carrie's escape room focused on Montgomery Place, a historic home located on the campus of Bard College in upstate New York. The concept behind the game was a historic robbery that took place in the 19th century. The format was ingeniously designed. The entire game was contained within a box and included a series of intriguing challenges in separate envelopes. Each challenge included archival photos and historic information. Progression from one challenge to the next was controlled through a smartphone and series of QR codes. We show these images here and we tell you this because we really want to credit Carrie here because as you will later see, our game relies heavily on hers. After much deliberation, we decided to focus our game on the one set of objects that never leaves the museum. The set of six ancient Assyrian reliefs from the palace of Azur Nazar Paul II. They are literally bolted to the wall and beautifully displayed in our ancient gallery. It occurred to us that the reliefs were perfect. The story of their excavation is an exciting one and offers important lessons on the ethics of collecting antiquities. 
The museum and Dartmouth Library were filled with great archival information and documentation for us to use. They have rich iconographic symbolism. They contain their own secret code in the form of the standard inscription, a repetitive accounting of the greatness of the king in cuneiform. The reliefs actually form the walls of the rooms in the Assyrian palace, which seemed in keeping with an escape room game. They are part of Dartmouth's history. And finally, they are not only the most permanent installation in the museum, but also among the most beloved objects in our collection. Focusing on the Assyrian reliefs would allow us to create a game we could continue to use far into the future. We wanted to create a game that could be played by a large number of people in our new atrium space, but could also be taken across campus and played by clubs and groups of Dartmouth students. We decided the game would introduce players to these objects and their history, and that we would follow each game with a facilitated experience in the galleries with the original works of art. So let's begin by diving into the actual game. The game begins with a fictional challenge, but all other information related to the reliefs is true. Only the pretext for the challenge is fictional. The essential challenge of the game is to determine the original location of the museum's reliefs in the palace of Azure Nazar Paul II. The urgency behind this challenge is an imaginary exhibition scheduled for 2020 and a digital recreation of the palace. So in a minute, but not yet, I'll give you some time to read the excerpts from our rather lengthy call for submissions. The letter really sets the stage for the game. And I've excerpted it here in the next four slides. So I'll give you time to read each slide. So this is the first one. So I'll let you all quietly read this to yourself. And I'll give you another couple of seconds before going to the next. Okay, this is the second excerpt. Okay, and I'll move on to the third. And really take a moment to look at these two images. And then this is the last. And don't worry about the QR code just yet.
Okay. So the call for submissions is long on purpose, and we know maybe it's a little too long, um, but it provides background information and helps participants transition into the space of the game. So I just want to remind you that the premise is fictional, but all other information that we include is otherwise truthful. So now is the time where we need your, your devices, your tablet or your phone. Um, so go ahead, take out your phone and you are going to want to open your camera app and just hover your camera app over the screen, over the QR code and a link should appear. When the link appears, go ahead and click on it. And maybe give me a physical thumbs up when you've got into, okay, great, I see some thumbs up. Um, and you basically should receive a Google form that says success. And if you've successfully navigated to that page, give us a virtual or a physical thumbs up. So this little tester QR code is how we know that everyone knows how to work the technology because we will continue to use this QR code technology throughout the game. So to start the game, you will enter a code word. The code word and all answers to follow will be in title case, the first letter capitalized. So please go ahead and enter the code word Dartmouth, capital D, and then click next. And again, this is just, you know, for us to make sure that all of our participants are on the same page with the technology. Um, I am about to turn it over to Vivian to walk through the game, but I'm aware that a lot of you joined during the introduction. And so I just wanted to reiterate that today um, is an interactive presentation and we'll, we'll, we will be breaking you into small groups later. Um, and so if you feel comfortable turning on your video, um, it would be great to really have folks connect. Okay, I will turn it over. Um, to Vivian. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vivian Ladd. I'm teaching specialist at the Hood Museum of Art. Um, I noticed in the chat we got a couple of comments about Androids and about having to download a QR reader. Um, for those of you who are having trouble accessing the QR reader, not to worry. Um, we will uh, this experience will be um, made available to people who don't have the QR reader um, available on their phone. It's just more fun if you can play. All right, once we're sure that everyone is comfortable with the technology, we hand out the escape room boxes. This game is made up of six challenges, one envelope per challenge. Each envelope is labeled with a QR code, which leads to a Google form. Inside the envelopes are images, clues, and primary source documents. Inside the box, participants find some scrap paper and pencils, an archaeologist's brush, and a tool, which looks like a flashlight. Let's try out the first challenge together. Once again, open your camera app and hover it over the QR code for envelope one. And click on the link that appears. The instruction reads, I carried the reliefs on my back across the desert. If every one of my kind were to die today, there would still be more next year. What am I? Inside envelope one are four pieces of paper, all potential clues that may help players solve the challenge. In a moment, we're going to give you four minutes to try to solve this challenge. Remember, you can always zoom in on any of the documents by adjusting the zoom ratio or simply dragging the right margin um, of your PowerPoint to the right um, to just enlarge the images on the screen. If you think you have the answer, you can go ahead and type it into the Google form and then click next. 
wrong answers will result in a hint. Now, just a word to the wise, this challenge often takes people 10 minutes to solve. So don't worry if you don't figure out in the time allotted, just give it a try. I'm gonna start the clock now. You have 30 more seconds, at which point I am going to provide the answer. All right, that's time. The answer is mule. If you didn't solve the, the challenge, go ahead and type mule into your Google form, then take a few moments to read the content uh, that pops up. This first challenge serves as a kind of warm up. Some of our participants know this riddle and guess mule right away. 
Others guess camel or donkey and try that by entering it into the Google form. The hint that appears is this is a four letter word. There are in fact multiple ways to solve this challenge. The word mule appears in the archival letter sent to Dartmouth from the excavation and there is also a mule in the background of the image that depicts a camel. The content pop-up provides historical context and a glimpse behind the scenes. When visitors come to the museum and see our reliefs, they're beautifully restored. This image shows how brutally each panel was ultimately shaved down and cut in thirds in order to be transported. So now it's your turn. In a moment, we're gonna send you into breakout rooms with four other participants. We will also place a link in the chat. The link will connect you to a Google slideshow that includes the QR code for envelope two. Once again, you're gonna begin by opening your camera, hovering it over the QR code, and a Google form with the challenge will appear. The challenge also, the, the slideshow also contains the contents of envelope two. Um, the slideshow has two slides, so you're going to need to toggle between the two. In each breakout room, we're going to need one person familiar with Zoom to open the link and then share their screen with others. You will have 10 minutes together in the breakout room. A countdown clock will appear on your screen. Now, a couple of rules. No cheating. Please don't look things up on your phone. Talk to each other and work together. If you solve the challenge, go ahead and put the answer in your Google form and read the content pop-up. If you don't solve the challenge, that's fine too. We'll go over it when we return. You know, getting the answer is not really the purpose of this exercise. As a workshop demonstration, we really just wanted you to have um, an opportunity to truly experience the game, to confront brand new material, to collaborate with a team you may or may not know, and to work against the clock. Please remember, escape rooms use confusion and frustration to make the game hard and hopefully fun. So Jamie is now going to go ahead and put that link into the chat. And in just a moment, she will send you all out into your breakout rooms. Jamie, Isadora, and I will pop into each breakout room just to be sure you're not having any trouble with the tech. See you later. Have some fun, we'll see you in 10 minutes. All right, I have Tegan in here. This is gonna be awesome. <laughs> We've got a uh, close geographic uh, segment going on here. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> I can share, I pulled up the um, slide. I can share my screen if that's helpful. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And then Heidi is going to be helping through chat. Great. So, Heidi, I'm not sure. You can actually do it to everyone, so I think, um, you know, to help solve the clues and stuff like that. Oops. Or I could be your voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can everybody see this okay? You want me to read the question out loud, the challenge? Sure. It deals with numbers, which I'm not excited about. <laughs> <laughs> this number is the first positive number that is equal to double the sum of its digits. Double the sum of its digits. All right. Well, it's gotta be over 10, because that won't make sense otherwise. Um, 
is there a way to do this other than brute forcing it? Because we could just like think of numbers until we get there. <laughs> and just plug them in. <laughs> yeah. Also, I'm not sure. I don't see. Oh, I see. I just totally missed the fact that there's a QR code on this screen. And so I couldn't find the question. Anytime you think you've designed something idiot proof, one of your visitors will build a better idiot. Um, all right. Trust me, I have to do that with conference. <laughs> yeah. And there's always one person like, oh, I didn't catch that one. Um, so I guess rather than brute forcing it, we can sort of, because it's the first positive number. It is equal to the double sum of digits. Is it four? Oh, no, that would be double the sum of the digits, not the sum of the digits. Okay, Jeff, you want to make your round too. Hi, all. You all might want to make your shared screen just full screen so you can see the images um, better. And don't hesitate to drag that right margin to the right to minimize the thumbnails and enlarge the PowerPoint. Okay. Sorry, are people having trouble seeing it? I can see it, but I confess I don't, I, ha I haven't solved the puzzle of, of what we're looking at as related to the number puzzle. Do you want me to go back and slide that to the other slide? Yeah. Although it looks like we should also be able to go to the link independently, right? Oh yeah, yeah you could definitely do it independently um, and stuff, that's not a problem. All right. And maybe has something to do with the weight of the objects, maybe? Yeah. It talks about them being too heavy. So maybe it's trying to figure out what the weight is based on the um, I don't know what these symbols are. Are they directional? Yeah. Let's see, how, what if we count how many triangles there are? One, two, three, four, yeah. six, seven. If I can interrupt for a second, 18 is, the, is double the sum of its digits. that work. Um, there is 18 separate panels <laughs> as, we're sitting, as you're counting them right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that worked. 18 works? Yeah, 18 works. Pretty sure if one of my nieces was in here, they would have caught it immediately. <laughs> uh, you probably need to, um, Count something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what's the next thing then? So I guess we just basically wait until. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I 
it's amazing that they were just like broken like that. That's so kind of like horrific. <laughs> yeah. Terrific is the after effects of what just happened to everything over there. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like a puzzle like this, you have to think about, there's a lot of things that could be clues and you have to figure out which, which lead to follow. Yeah, have you guys done an actual escape room itself? Mm -hmm. Just once. Yeah, oh. I was stuck in there with my niece and her friend and it was mass chaos. And the first <laughs> time we did it, it was basically, it was just a darkened like apartment room and I had my niece and my best friend with us and it was just her screaming the entire time <laughs> 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 it was her idea this is what she wanted to do a day with auntie so I'm just like oh we don't want to do this again <laughs> <laughs> and I guess she wanted to do it the next year too so <laughs> okay, going guide I need to go find a charger I think <laughs> <laughs> So I see some of us have the our locations on our um, username thing. Heidi, where are you? Forbes House. I was trying to remember. I'm like, I know it's a house museum somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a, a thoroughly Massachusetts group. Mm -hmm. That's fine. We've all been there. <laughs> and what do you mean, Heather? You don't have encyclopedic knowledge of all NEMA members? You should be ashamed. Eddie's been a member for a while. I should know this by now. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a little scary when I could tell someone was like, oh yeah, you were at this place at your last job. And they're like, and I'm like, I remember random things like that. I won't be able to remember your name like visually, <laughs> but I can tell you where you worked. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think Gina, you've joined us for like majority of our stuff that we've been doing. <laughs> I try to, it's like good to stay connected. We're going to be remote for a long time at Smith. So mm. yeah. Yeah. Cause I noticed MIT museum officially announced they're not opening this year. I think yeah. all the other like universities are kind of waiting a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely won't open to the public this year. We thought we were going to be open to students, but then Smith reversed its decision mm -hmm. to be open, so we'll be remote. The museum where I work is at a hospital and we're going to be hosting a flu clinic soon. So we'll be open, but not as uh, not, not as in the way that you want. There's a different <laughs> yeah. set of challenges with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. That's so I guess we could leave and go into the main room now. Amy, can you let me know when you think everybody's back? Um, yes, it looks like we've, um, it looks like there's a couple more. Um, it looks like breakout room three is still, <laughs> breakout room four is still hanging out. <laughs> oh, Mary said sometimes it records the whole, the host, the whole breakout room. That is, daunting because that is me <laughs> i could kind of speed along before i post it if you want. <laughs> great <laughs> um okay it looks like everyone's back vivian okay great great welcome back everybody we hope there were some successes out there and at the very least you had some fun um so let's review the challenge for envelope two was another riddle a math problem this number is the first number that is equal to double the sum of its digits. 
The envelope included an archival letter and drawing made during the excavation and some puzzle pieces. The answer to the riddle is 18. Now, somebody, some, some, some of you solved this problem and um, fairly quickly, and I let you know that there are in fact three ways to solve this problem. So first of all, you could simply solve the math. Um, that's, that's one way. Um, you may also have realized that there were 18 pieces of the puzzle that you received in this envelope. Each panel, as you know, historically was cut into thirds. Six times three equals 18. Also, those of you who are very observant may have noticed the page number on the second archival letter, which is in fact 18. The content pop-up for this challenge provides information about the display of the reliefs at Dartmouth and their conservation. I am now going to walk you through the next four envelopes and challenges so you get a sense of what participants need to do in order to complete the game. Please continue to play along. Play along. Open your camera app and scan the QR code for envelope three. The challenge reads, translate the cuneiform symbols into letters. Use the six letters to form a word. My thumbnails are covering the challenge. That relates to an object important to an Assyrian ritual. The envelope con contains a piece of a dial, a detail of the cuneiform writing on the reliefs, and a cuneiform alphabet. By now, in the game, each team has assemb assembled those 18 puzzle pieces to represent the six Assyrian reliefs. Each assemble panel has a stamped cuneiform symbol. To solve this challenge, participants must first find the cuneiform symbols on the alphabet card. The symbols correspond to the letters P, S, T, H, a and E. Only one word in the English language can be, can be spelled with these six letters, but it's a word that most people don't know. This is a much harder challenge than the previous two. The answer to, the, to this uh, challenge is spathe. A clue can be found through the hint on the Google form um, that says that the term that we're looking for is a botanical term. We encourage participants to keep all the contents from the envelopes on their table. Some of the images or objects found in the box or in the envelopes are needed right away. Others might be needed later and still others are purely contextual or red herrings. The hint in the Google form alerts players to the fact that there was in fact a botanical image of a date palm tree in their first envelope. The word spathe appears on that drawing. The content pop-up explains what a spathe is and its role in the iconographic program of the reliefs. There is also information about cuneiform and the standard inscription. I'll give you just a, a few seconds to read that pop-up. All right, let's move on to challenge four. Go ahead and scan your QR code to read the next challenge. It says, the Assyrian reliefs were once colored. Only a little pit of pigment remains. Where? Envelope four contains a painted reconstruction of the throne room of the Northwest Palace at Nimrud 
and a second piece of a dial. This reconstruction image is a decoy. In order to solve this challenge, participants must use what they already have, the black light from the box and the puzzle pieces. I'm gonna play a short vi video to demonstrate. As you can see, the black light illuminates the sandals of the king and one of his attendants in one panel and the sandals of another attendant on another panel. The answer to this challenge is sandals. Please go ahead and enter it into your Google form, then read the content pop-up. You know the drill. Go ahead and scan the QR code for challenge number five. This says simply, you need three letters in the English alphabet in order to proceed. In this envelope, participants receive more decoys, details and drawings of the shoulder and hem of the king's incised gown. They also receive a new tool, a black piece of paper with three cutouts. Again, I'm gonna play a short video. As you can see, after some trial and error, players realize that the black piece of paper matches exactly the size of the cuneiform alphabet. And once it's rotated correctly, the cutouts reveal three letters, G, H, and L. So go ahead and enter G, H, L into your Google form. and read the content pop-up. Finally, go ahead and scan the QR code for our last envelope, envelope six. In this envelope, players receive this map and a third piece of the dial along with a paper fastener to put the dial together. Remember, a long, uh, earlier in the game, players received two other pieces of the dial but didn't yet know how to use them. They now have everything they need to solve the final challenge, which is locating on this map of the palace the original placement of the Dartmouth reliefs. I'll give you just a, a few seconds to read uh, the Google form that outlines this final challenge. And once again, we will use a video to show you how this final challenge works.
Once the dial is assembled, participants see that it is made up of letters and numbers. Close examination of the map reveals that it is also made up of letters and numbers. Letters for the rooms and then numbers for the placement of, of Assyrian relief panels. If they're lucky, players remember that they just uncovered G, H, and L in the previous challenge. If they set their dial to G, and then look at the numbers included in room G, five, six, nine, and 11, and line up any two of those numbers, they can begin to lock the dial in place. As you can see here, we have H23 and 35. And as we look at the map, there are only two panels in that room, which are in fact 23 and 35. Now the dial is locked and room L will reveal the placement of the final two panels, seven and 11. All of this working leads to a complicated string of letters and numbers that are in fact the, the, place, the original placement of the Dartmouth reliefs. Go ahead and put them into your Google form. I'll read them aloud to help you out. They are G9, G11, H23, H35, L7, L11. Once again, that's G9, G11, H23, H35, L7, L11. And if you do it correctly, you will, your Google uh, form will read mission accomplished. You have in fact completed your research in time and identified the original location of the Dartmouth panels in the palace of King Arshanasar Paul II. And that is our game. Thank you so much for playing along virtually. We hope it gave you a sense of how the physical game would be played in person. I'm now gonna turn things over to Isadora. Thank you, Vivian, and well done everyone for playing along. I'm Isadora Talia, the Campus Engagement Coordinator at the Hood Museum of Art, um, and I will just share my screen quickly to get us started. All right, can everyone see that? All right, perfect, thank you. So as you experience, the overarching premise of the game is to reconstruct the Northwest Palace and to determine in which rooms the Hood's reliefs were originally situated. Determining this overarching framework was crucial to our planning process, because once we knew the nature of the final puzzle that would solve the game, we could begin to work backwards. There was certainly a lot of brainstorming and research to start. What tools and puzzles do we want to include? What museum publications and archival material do we have access to? What about the artwork do we really want to point out and make sure our audiences learn about? We consulted museum publications, spoke with curators and Dartmouth professors who were knowledgeable about the reliefs and their history, and even went into Dartmouth's archives to mine through historical documents. I would say we met about once a week, more or less, during the summer and early fall of 2019 to develop the game. A big part of that time was devoted to making the physical boxes. We used the office printer a lot to print out um, paper materials. We found inspiration on Google and Pinterest, ordered materials we didn't already have in the office, either from Amazon or Etsy, um, and really tried to divvy up tasks based on everyone's strengths and skills, from writing to Photoshop, et cetera. We spent about $150 to make 10 game boxes, which have been played by 231 people so far. So in terms of materials and supplies, this was pretty inexpensive. It's less than a dollar per participant. And really the investment was staff time and labor, uh, but we found it to be worth it. We have seen some wear and tear on the paper material and expect some upkeep as more people play reprinting things, replacing batteries, possibly laminating a couple of things. So you can budget for that as well. Before our official launch event, 
we had various groups test out the challenges. We wanted to see how audiences tackled the puzzles and made sure we got feedback. Was the game too long, too short, too easy, too difficult? We made sure to do various test rounds uh, with Hood staff, with our student interns, with groups of friends even. This really allowed us to see how different age groups reacted to the game. We officially launched the game during a community adult event. Because we could only fit eight tables in our atrium, which you see here on the left, uh, the event, we limited registration to 45 people. And the event filled in a matter of days, with 55 people adding themselves to the wait list, which is huge for us. Clearly people were hungry for this type of hands-on, competitive, fun experience. Ages of participants at this program uh, ranged from a high school student who attended with her parents to a team of 70-year-olds. Going into the evening, we assumed based on our test rounds that teams would finish around the same time, around 45 minutes. At that point, we would plan to bring them into the galleries to see the reliefs in person. However, uh, we learned that that was not the case the night of. Some teams finished in 27 minutes, others took 45. Uh, so we had to accommodate these staggered finishing times. To do that, we brought teams into the galleries in waves. So after a couple teams finished, a staff member took them in to look at the reliefs while the rest finished the puzzles. And even though this was unexpected, um, in the end, we worked, it worked really well. Um, as a lot of museum people know, it's easier to fit 20 people around a work of art than in 45. Um, so we felt we had a successful game that participants could finish within a 30 to 45 minute range pretty comfortably. We were extremely excited at the response and couldn't wait to launch with uh, additional audiences. In the winter, uh, I launched the game with a group of students in the Museum Club, our volunteer student organization. There are 25 students, so we split them into five groups of five. Everything was going great. Uh, until the first group finished in 13 minutes and the last in 18. So this is when we knew we had a problem to address. Uh, this was supposed to serve both community and student audiences, but the students felt it was way too easy, too short. They also wanted a game that would last about 30 to 45 minutes. And actually through surveys, um, we learned that 60% of community adults thought the game was just challenging enough, whereas 60% of students thought it was too easy. So the data's there. Uh, Vivian, Jamie, and I really had to decide, would we add more challenges to make the game longer, create a whole second version of the game that was more difficult? How can we serve both audiences effectively? We were really com committed to doing that. Before adding more envelopes though, or developing a whole second version, we felt we should try for a few intermediary steps, such as removing most of the hints embedded into the Google Forms and limiting student groups to three whenever possible. The students had also admitted to skipping over the content pop-ups because they felt the text was too long. So we shortened it wherever possible and amended our gamekeeper script to say clues may be embedded in there to ensure that they would read all the text. So just between us, uh, there are no clues hidden in the content pop-ups, but we are careful to say that clues may be embedded in there. This helped tremendously and had, of course, a twofold benefit. By reading all the text, students began to slow down and we could feel confident that they were learning about the release along the way. The small tweaks ultimately made a big difference in leveling the playing field for everyone. And though usually our escape room events are facilitated by staff members, uh, we've experimented with a student run escape room experience. Uh, we worked with Dartmouth housing communities um, back in the winter uh, to host an intramural competition between six residential houses on campus on a Saturday afternoon. Two of our student employees facilitated it, uh, making it the first time the event was run by students for students. 60 students came. They chose to take time out of their Saturday afternoon, afternoon to learn about the reliefs and see an original work of art, even if it was under the guise of a fun competition. And by training students to run the event instead of staff, we were able to extend our reach and allow students to really make the experience their own. So in short, uh, here's some lessons we learned that we hope will be useful to you if you, you, develop, excuse me, you decide to develop your own game. One, don't be afraid to let go. 
Early on, we had an envelope that included a rubbing with textured paper and pencils that we really liked because it required tools, alluded to the practice of archaeology, but participants had a lot of trouble with it. We tried to, tweaking it a few times, really tried to make it work, but it just didn't. So we scrapped it. Don't be afraid to let go if something isn't working. Secondly, think about the why. Why do you want people to play this game? How will this game further your mission and align with your institutional goals? As a teaching museum dedicated to object-based learning, it was important to us that people really learn about the reliefs. And this commitment guided a lot of our decisions. For example, instead of limiting the game to 30 minutes, making a big deal about the ticking clock and putting pressure on teams to finish quickly, we decided to allow up to 45 minutes, assuring players that this would give them time to comfortably read the material and solve the puzzles. We also made sure every puzzle would reveal new and factual information about the reliefs. Again, we wanted the game to be fun and to further our mission. And a quick tip, the more your game aligns with or furthers your mission, the easier it will be to get support and resources from leadership. Keep the text short where you can. As I mentioned, the students had admitted to skipping over text they felt was too long. Now, I don't know if it's because they're so competitive or used to skimming their assigned readings or both, um, but we decided to pare down the text in our content pop-up significantly and are still considering shortening the call for submissions letter, which we all read together at the beginning. Think about the facilitator's role. For us, having two facilitators really helps because it allows us to stagger viewing of the reliefs in a way that accommodates both speedy and slower groups. When facilitating, we sometimes do give out hints, um, but we ask the groups that are struggling whether or not they want a hint first. Some people definitely enjoy the struggle more than others. On a related note, resetting the boxes does take time. So having a few people familiar with the game uh, and with access to a checklist definitely helps. Different audiences tackled the game differently. We did learn that younger audiences uh, tend to finish faster, possibly because they're more familiar with escape room games in general, uh, with QR codes, with Google Forms. It's totally okay if that happens. In general, people of all ages love hands-on learning. We even have a high school class that wants to come to the museum to do the escape room. We actually had their visit scheduled for March, but of course had to postpone due to COVID. So we hope to get them in in the future. And perhaps most importantly, games generate excitement about work of art, works of art. People were thrilled to look at the reliefs afterward. We expected to have to facilitate the in-gallery component but found that participants hardly needed any facilitation at all. They learned so much solving the puzzles and reading the content pop-ups that they approached the works with, enth with enthusiasm, pointing to different details in the panels, sharing their discoveries with each other, asking us questions. It was really hard actually to get them out of the gallery at the end of the evening. So of course, as educators and facilitators, we were thrilled to see that the game had really sparked their curiosity. in terms of our next steps. So before the COVID-19 crisis, we were planning to test out a checkout system in which museum visitors could check out an ER box from the an escape room box from the front desk and play it on their own time in our atrium without participating in a formal facilitated event. We weren't able to pilot this in April, but we want to explore whether this is possible for this upcoming academic year. 50% of the student body will be in residence during the fall term at Dartmouth um, but instruction and engagement will primarily be virtual to ensure social distancing. That being said, if students are able to interact in small groups within their dorm or maybe on their dorm floor, you know, perhaps they can check out a box, play on their own time in their dorm buildings, um, then return the box to the museum where it'll sit isolated for a few days before a staff member resets it. Uh, again, this is something we just started kind of thinking about, but of course we'd look to our friends at the library to see what procedures they have in place for checking out books and materials and do the same for these boxes. Over the summer, we started developing a second escape room game with portable boxes um, that, was set, that would be centered um, on another treasured work in our collection, the mural cycle by Jose Clemente Orozco called the Epic of American Civilization, which you can see here at the bottom of this slide. Uh, this mural cycle, completed in 1934, is actually located on the lower level of our main library um, and was named a National Historic Landmark in 2013. It's rich with content and themes still relevant today, 
Its permanent location at the heart of campus makes it an, an ideal jumping off point for another game. This version, though, is designed to be played inside the physical room, which already has tables and chairs in it. Um, so it will provide new opportunities, certainly, um, but we have to put this on hold until we can host in-person events again. In the meantime, we're about halfway through developing a game that will be purely digital based on outdoor sculpture. This will live on a square space site and be played by individual students and community members either on their desktop computers or on their phones. Our hope is that students and the community adults um, who, who live in the area will play it on their phones while walking around to each of the sculptures. But we're making it flexible that even those who aren't physically on campus can still play. And ultimately what we learned developing the Assyrian Relief relief game has given us a great foundation with which we can not only approach these two other games, but future endeavors as well. So in closing, uh, we encourage you to think about whether an escape room is a good fit for your institution. We certainly had a lot of fun developing the game and it's rewarding to see our audiences enjoy it. So look up virtual escape rooms escape or escape rooms in general online. Google DIY escape room to get ideas like we did and see what might work for you. We thank you for joining us today and would love to answer your questions. And I'll leave our emails here um, in case folks have questions or comments that they'd wanna email us later on. Great, thanks Isadora. Um, do you mind unspotlighting and then hopefully people can see you and me and Vivian while we answer some questions. Um, great, and um, feel, we have a couple questions. Feel free to add more into the chat. Um, so the first question is how have you utilized or adapted the game into this pandemic era? Um, and, and you touched on that a little, but do you maybe want to give a sneak preview of the kinds of ways we're working um, on the virtual escape room? Isadora, maybe? Sure. Um, so we do have a number of outdoor sculptures that are sort of splattered around campus. Um, so we really want this game to be purely digital. So unlike the Syrian Relief game, it won't be like a physical box or paper materials for folks to play with. Um, it'll be a Squarespace website that will still contain puzzles and um, you know password protected pages and all that. So you're solving challenges to move on to the next step. Um, but you'll either play it you know, on your desktop computer or laptop, um, or you can actually take a phone, go to the sculpture, play it there before moving on to the next one. Um, so we're in this sort of middle phases of developing that now, um, but we're, we're excited for it, definitely. And especially, I mean, for us in New England, we know fall is a beautiful time of year, so we're trying to get it done quickly while people can still get outside. And, um, and part of the reason we chose to focus on outdoor sculpture is to capitalize on the excitement and curiosity that is generated by playing the game. Um, ultimately, it is our goal to bring people to original works of art. So rather than trying to transform our Assyrian relief game into a digital format um, and knowing that participants would not be able to come into the museum to see the reliefs, it made more sense for us to use works of art that are in fact available. Um, and Isadora, um, would future iterations include students as game developers or researchers? I think that would be so cool. Um, I'm sure they come up with things that are a lot tougher than what we have been able to come up with. Um, you know, we do have um, student interns uh, that we work with. They uh, work with us 10 hours a week. Um, so maybe that's a group that could work on it or um, the museum club, which I mentioned, which is our volunteer student organization. Um, so I can certainly see that happening, especially, you know, with this sort of virtual remote mode uh, continuing for the future. Maybe the Squarespace website can serve as a model that they can then um, develop something new and it could live on the same website, etc. So yeah. Um, and then the next question is how did we decide which students and groups would be user testers? Um, and, and this was fairly simple. We just, we, we used the people that were close to us. Um, so our, our initial testing 
um, started with staff. Um, so we just started with museum staff. Um, and then um, we each tested it with our group of friends because we wanted to see, um, we knew that this would be for adults, community adults and students. And so we really wanted a range of community adults. Um, and so between using our friends and using staff, we did get that range. Um, and then, like Isadora said, we have interns and museum club, and so those are the students we tested it with. Um, so we really just used our internal circles. Um, and then the next question is, how did you go about developing the QR codes and pop-up technology? Did you do this internally or use a developer? Um, and we did everything internally, you know, from creating the technology to making the tactiles. Um, we didn't outsource anything. Um, the QR codes was actually, that, that was something I worked on. It was surprisingly simple. I, I didn't, um, I had never done a QR code or um, a Google form game before, but um, I knew that the Google forms needed to have hints and that they needed to have a correct answer. And so just by kind of I didn't even have to Google anything just by kind of pressing buttons. I was able to find those settings and then the QR code. We just um, We just found a free QR code generator online um, and I'm happy to share um, those Google form lesson learned um, lessons learned or um, when when we're answering another question. I can pull up the free QR code generator, but it was as someone who doesn't do a lot of work in tech. It was it was simpler than I thought. Um, so there's another question. Um, has there been any interest in developing or using something like this in tandem with a class? I'm curious about faculty interest. Vivian, maybe you could speak to that um, about the professor we spoke to. Yeah, so we had a classics professor uh, come to one of our adult uh, escape room nights and um, you know he was fascinating. He was really into the game. His team did not finish first, um, and uh, he had a lot of thoughts about the game afterwards, maybe different challenges he might have tried, things that he really appreciated about the game. Um, he helped us refine one of our clues um, because it was really important to him that it was that everything was absolutely accurate and not misleading in any way. And he definitely was interested in having his students come and play the game and really interested in the technology for his class. Um, I'm not sure where that went ultimately, um, but certainly um, many students on campus have played the game uh, at this point, and um, I think there's great potential there. Um, there was also a classics professor who um, who also came to that event who was interested in doing something with our Greek amphora um, and trying to create something herself um, based on on the escape room game. Um, and I think as as faculty come to us interested in the Assyrian reliefs, now that we have this developed, it's something we can offer to their classes. Um, I think those are all the questions we've gotten, but if anyone has another one, um, you can feel free to raise your hand. I can, um, you all can unmute yourself. So if you maybe want to raise your hand, if anyone has any final questions. Um, and if not, um, do feel free to reach out to any of us at any point. Um, we really believe that, that you know, we all should benefit from from collective work, especially now during COVID. Yeah, Mickey. There we go. Um, how long did it take you from um, idea to um, how long did the whole process take, would you say? Mickey, I think we can't quite hear your headset. It, it's tilted down. I'm Maybe so there sorry. <laughs> How long did it take you um, from the first inception, the thought to completion, approximately, do you think? Amy, take that one. It's all a blur. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, so Isadora went to the, conf the NEMA conference, not last November, but the November before, um, raved about Carrie Sclafani's session. Then Vivian and I attended another session. We um, crashed a history camp um, conference in Boston when we were there for the NAEA conference. 
And um, I mean, Carrie said we could crash it. Um, and so we saw it in end of March. So then we must have gotten started on it in June and we were ready for groups by October. So June to October. Yeah, and it's really been very manageable. I mean, we have maybe a meeting a week, a meeting every other week for an hour um, to brainstorm together. We're really good about divvying up tasks. Once we have a direction, you know, we rely on each other's strengths. You can pretty efficiently pull this together. Um, and then the, the manufacturer is really quite simple. Um, so it never felt particularly onerous or challenging. It was really great fun. And it's a great morale builder. I mean, it's just so outside the box of anything any of us had ever done before um, that, uh, you know, I just highly recommend it for internal team building um, just because it, it is great fun to put together. Yeah, especially now to really flex those creative muscles when we feel like everything else is a little bit uncertain and out of our control. Um, so Gina asked if we could share, when we finish the digital escape room, if we could share it um, with Nima, and we are happy to. Um, and she said that she's inspired to develop something like this for K through 12 groups. Um, and as am I, I don't know if Gina's still here. Oh yes, Gina, you are. Um, I teach our, all of our middle, our elementary and middle school visitors. Um, so if you and I want to put our heads together at some point, I'm definitely thinking about how, because all my classes will be virtual, my field trips, I'm thinking about how we could use something like this. Um, and then Mary asked how many hours total it took. Um, we had a one hour meeting a week. And then I'd say we probably did on our own one hour of work a week. Um, so kind of two hours a week from June to October. And, and I, I it's just, going a lot faster now that we've done one. So our, our, our second and third, our, our, we, we've sped it up a lot. And I would just add to that to build in time for testing. Um, you know, I think if the launch event was in October, we probably started testing like August or maybe like early September to really like have a couple of iterations of it, a couple of different types of groups test it. Um, so I would just build in some time for that as well. And we um, we got our staff to help us out by saying, it'll be a part of a happy hour. We got our friends <laughs> to do it with some pieces. So, you know, and, and folks were really happy to um, help and provide feedback, so yeah. And then a question for our folks at, at, at NEMA, will there be access to our, the recording of this so that it can be shared with other yep, um, I will be having it posted on uh, the NEBA YouTube channel. So all of our recordings you can find there. Um, there's the link from Scarlett, or you can actually go to our calendar of events and there's a link there to um, our page there. Great, are there any other questions? Okay, thank you all so much for taking the time out of, out of your day. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you found it fun. I do want to thank you guys all for um, joining us today and definitely for Jamie, Vivian, and Isadora. Um, this was actually one of our conference sessions um, that had to go digital. Um, thank you for one of my favorite words, pivoting um, <laughs> into this digital format. I'm glad that we were still able to share um, this information. Um, and also a little bit of housekeeping. I know there's a lot of university um, museums on this phone call. We're actually currently looking for a new tag chair for the College and University and Academic um, Museum. So if you are interested or have questions, definitely contact me and a staff member and we'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. Um, so I guess I want to say thank you and make sure to join us for a future NEMA event. And again, if you guys do have any um, ideas for future programming, um, let us know. We'd be more than happy to discuss it. So thanks everybody, and we will see you at another event. Bye. It's like Jamie has control, I can't stop it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, you have to end the meeting. <laughs>